of this stuff in this, in this talk is my, the file system that I brought has debugging facilities to capture traces. So I ran virtual machines on the Tintree appliance and the Tintree appliance will happily give me heat maps and traces. Uh, virtualization also helps because I can then take one of the systems I'm studying and just create a clone and run experiments on that clone. So I can actually take a live data and sort of freeze it to look at what's going on. So uh, I only have three examples in this talk and three, three examples is, is not very much, but I've got my development VM which has a system disk, it's got the Linux file system on it, it's got my a, a larger disk that has source code and I do all my builds on it, and I grabbed one of our QA team's database servers running Oracle. And all these are ext4 file systems. Uh, I'd like to have more diversity, but I didn't have time. I'll, I'll, I have a slide later on on all the things I'd like to do, but, but didn't have time. Um, so one of the, the first visualizations I usually start with is just let's, let's look at what's hot and what's not on the file system. Can we just get a static view of where is the data on the disk, how hot is it? And so these, these are not real informative and I didn't do a good job on graphic design, but the, these are our three disks, my, my working disk, my system disk, and the database disk. And black is areas that we haven't written yet. So you see, you know, there, there are bands of stuff that's used and stuff that isn't. Red is the hottest data. This area here is actually the swap partition on my system disk. And it's a good thing that that is, is only sort of medium warm. I don't want to be swapping a lot, I can tell that. Um, but the most interesting thing is actually zooming in. And I, I replot it in color. So this is again one pixel per 8K block. Um, uh, our system does thin provisioning at a, at a larger granularity. The, the thing I want to point out here is how much both used and unused data and hot and cold data are mixed together at a very fine granularity. And you see this in, in a lot of storage systems that, uh, you know, there's, e even though they're trying to do smart things, you, you end up with very fine granularity behavior as the system ages that, you know, uh, on the second graph, I, I used red for the very hottest blocks in the system and blue for the coldest blocks in the system, and they're, they're literally right next to each other and intermixed. So if you're doing caching at a big granularity like a gigabyte, you actually miss a lot of this. You're, you're pulling cold and hot data together. Um, so what's, and feel free to jump up and interrupt with questions or, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Uh, so, so like I said, this this is this is uh, builds. I do C++ and Java builds. Um, this is the disk I do it on. Um, I didn't get a chance to ask our QA team which of the things they stored on here. It's not what's backing our vCenter server. I think they store test results on it. They just just a backlog of every test run. So. Uh, Okay, so one of the things you can do to start aggregating this data is, is look at histograms. And uh, typically you'll have a lot more things in the coldest bucket than in any other bucket in this histogram. So what I did is just plot as a log scale so it wasn't just one huge peak. And this is what we'd expect is, is we got, have a lot of cold data in the system and a, a fairly heavy tail, actually, of, of hot data. And this, this little bump is, I think, an artifact. We actually made the buckets bigger once they got past 64 accesses. Um, but here are my other two disks. And this, this is very interesting, I don't have an explanation for, is the distribution's actually bimodal on, on the system disk, the, the root file system containing user bin and all that. Uh, you know, there's, there's a a peak of cold data, but then there's this other peak of sort of medium hot data, and I, I don't know what that means yet. But uh, bimodal distributions are kind of rare. It's, uh, it's, it's unexpected to see this here. Most models don't take that into account. And if that's real, then if you're actually building storage systems, that, that might be something you want to know about. So the other way, um, which we can do on Tintree, because Tintree uh, does dedupe as well as, as caching, uh, as compression, 
for Flash is look at uh, the, the two-dimensional distribution of how deduplable is data, how similar is it to each other versus how, how frequently is it accessed. And I, I, the, the details are, are, there's a lot of numbers on here. I just want to focus on, on the summary here. The, the database has a lot of hot, undedupable data, which is sort of what you'd expect, that you're writing the same records in the same blocks in the database over and over, but they don't look like each other. You know, no, no two database entries are qu exactly the same. Even if it's the same entry in the database, you'd expect to have different log sequence numbers on the database pages themselves. So this is, you could say, yeah, this is, this is more or less what I expect to have happen. I, I, I have hot data because it's being accessed all the time, but it doesn't dedupe very well. Um, the system disk is quite different. That um, the thing that really stands out here is we've got a lot of hot dedupe data. So lots of people are running the same virtual machine as I am and have exactly the same set OS image. So they, those blocks all dedupe each other, but because I'm using it all the time, they, they stay hot. So this is sort of a, a different pattern. And then the working set is, is um, is a, a third type of pattern, that we've got some hot blocks in both high and, and low dedupe, but the, the thing that's interesting is this high dedupe cold, and which I interpret as you know, source files, that there's a lot of things where you, they're in our source repository, everybody's got them, but they don't get used too often when you're doing a comp compilation. They're documentation, they're files that get referenced only once per build, things like that. Um, so already we can sort of tell that these are different use cases just by looking at big aggregate statistics. And, and that might be something that's, that would be interesting to see more examples of. Can we really tell any information about the system from these, these gross uh, statistics, these very large scale statistics? Um, so if we wanna go to another level down, we can start asking what's, what's in those blocks? What's, what's in the one, I restricted myself to just what's in the 1% hottest blocks in the system. Um, so the first attempt does not work, real work, really work very well. What I did is uh, run the file utility, which tries to identify things by, by magic numbers and, and other, you know, uh, heuristics on the file, and just take those 8K blocks and run them through files. So it gets some right answer, you know, there is a lot of C++ program text on this, on this file system. This is the build system, so I'm, always, I'm checking out source files. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know what this means. I, I know there's no actual Pascal program text <laughs> uh, on, on our, in our file system, so, uh, you know, the, and, and just data as 60% is not very informative if I really want to understand what's going on. So we need, we need to do better than this. So let's take a detour. How can, how can we learn more ab about what's in the block and get up to, you know, things that humans deal with like files? So uh, ext4 and ext3 and ext2 have a debugger program called debugfs that lets you interactively explore what's in the file system. And you know, this is a great way for really understanding, you know, what's, what's the structure of the file system. You, you need, you, it, it's not very friendly, you need some, some understanding of what's there to get started, but um, for the purposes of, of this talk, you know, there's show super block information, so where is the metadata on disk? Given a reference data block, find the indirect nodes that point to it, basically which files point to which data blocks, and then for those files, what are they named? What's, what directory entry points to a particular file? So starting at a block, we can run this command to go one level up and then end check to actually turn in a file name. And we can also check whether it's free. Um, so here's a, here's a very simple picture of an ext file system uh, sh showing how those components I mentioned are, are laid out. There's a super block, it points at a bunch of descriptors. Descriptors have a large array of inodes. Inodes are what actually correspond to files, more or less. And each inode points at a large, it 
one or more data blocks, sometimes a lot of data blocks. So with this, you know, uh, so as I mentioned, I can, I can clone the disks I'm looking at and start mapping what's in those 1% top hottest blocks in the system to files. So this is uh, my system disk. So now we have a little more information that 40% of those, those top blocks are actually the file system journal. So the file system journal actually stores things that the file system is going to write uh, so it can happen in a, a consistent, crash consistent manner. Um, next 15% is actually free. Um, next 6% of that is the inodes themselves. That makes a lot of sense. The inodes are used whenever you're talking to a data block. And you can tell what my favorite editor is here. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I was pleased to see this. I know I use this all the time in the VM, and there, there it is popping up. Uh, it automatically checks for updates on, on a regular basis. <laughs> it, yeah, so, so, but, yeah, but this was the surprise that, that the yum cache in RPM is actually one of the hottest things in the system. I would not have predicted that. There's the C library, that makes sense, you know, it has to get read a lot, and other, other libraries. Okay, so, so that was sort of the non-obvious. Um, uh, one thing to get a little more data into a compressed form is just look at suffixes. So we see the SQL databases from the, the, the yum cache showing up at top. There, there's Emacs, because the file names end with dot one. Shared libraries are about 7% of that top 1%. So this, this sort of makes sense. The SQL is a surprise. Um, here's, a, you know, here are another few duh cases, but there's a surprise or two. If we look at that, that working set, that uh, build directory, this is again where I do all my checkouts and builds. What's surprising is that 53% of the hottest blocks are free. That the caching system is, is actually paying a lot of attention to these free blocks, and that's because ext4 just reuses the same blocks over and over. We're starting to learn a little more about the behavior of ext4. In a, in a file system like ZFS that's doing log structuring, it would always find new free blocks at, at the sequentially across the disk, and it would sort of smooth those out. But ext4 tends to, to reuse them, and so they end up being hot. That, that physical block is accessed over and over again by the file system. At the time I looked at it, it was free, but in, the, but in the recent past, it had been read and written quite a lot. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm doing a compilation and then doing another compilation or, you know, blowing away my tree or, so, um, and then you can see the other things that indicate that this is, this is a build disk, there's a lot of executables on it, there's object files, kernel object files, source files, you know, you, you can basically tell, you know, if, if I, I hope if I came to you fresh and asked what sort of disk has all that, you say, oh, you're doing a lot of software development. Um, here's the database. Unsurprisingly, the, the things that are hot in there are the databases. But when I gave this talk internally, one guy piped up and said, oh, you know, that's what happens if you don't configure temporary space per database, is the global temp database gets used over and over and over again, and that, that may not be what you actually want. So, you know, the, the, the QA guys just set up Oracle with some default configuration, and, and this is what popped out. Yeah. It, it might. Um, I mean, the the underlying. Yeah, but 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 the flash media is is actually running a file system underneath the block device to smooth that out among the physical cells. Um, it it does mean it's it's not very good for a caching system because, like I said, fifty three percent of the blocks we think we have to hold on most are not hot in the in the sense of actually contain useful data. Yeah. 
Um, okay, but so, you know, databases, files, redo logs, journal, we can say, yeah, you know, that, that's a database. Not, not very surprising. The, the really surprising thing for me was this, this so many hot blocks are free. Um, okay, so we can start asking a few other questions is, how good does ext4 do on metadata and data locality? That you'd like data, the metadata, the inode of what you're reading to be close to the data you're reading so that you can get them both in one physical access or cache them together. Um, it doesn't do very good except for this little band here and I don't know yet what files they are. But sometimes it's good, most of the time it's just, it's just all over the place. Um, something like ZFS that's log structured, again, we'd accept, expect it to do much better on this, that every time you write out data, you write out the new inode as well. Um, and this, this is some of the fallout, I think, of uh, reusing the free blocks. I, I looked at the correlation of if a block is hot, is its metadata block also hot? you'd expect that if you're reading or writing a data block often, that you'd have to update, you'd at least have to read the inode often. And, and there's not really much signal here, but there is this surprising population of data that is hot, but it is in cold metadata. And, and what the heck is up with that? Um, metadata does get cached in memory, but most, most metadata is hot anyway. You know, if, if you, most of it's on sort of the bottom half of this graph. My, my theory is that because the, uh, because there's so much churn on the free list, once in a while you pick up a block from that, that's hot on that free list, and you actually put cold data on it, and it just sort of gets pinned there. That, th that's interesting. I don't know whether ext4 is actually good at, at making the optimization or not, but that, that, that's an explanation I hadn't thought of. Okay. So, so that, that's sort of the end of the static analysis, is, is looking at the whole file system and, and what sort of things can we learn. I'm, th I'm sure there's more things we could learn here, but uh, now going back to traces, um, where we actually record each read and write and, and build up a log of what's going on. Um, this, this provides a much more dynamic view. So here is compiling hello world. So there's time, read or write, um, the block offset, and then I looked up using debugfs what's actually going on. So I actually mounted the file system fresh, so we're reading the super block, we're reading the descriptor table, we're reading the inodes, we're checking the journal to make sure it's clean. Um, I, now we're, we read the root directory, I cd'd to the, the directory so I can do the com compile, um, and there's the read of hello world.c. Um, it read, uh, I didn't show this, it's, it read all 4K even though it was only a 92 byte file. Um, that's, that's something that, that doesn't hurt us too badly one way or the other, but, but uh, some, fi some file systems actually do that differently. Um, now notice there's an eight second gap here between reading the file and writing out the compiled version. I can assure you Hello World did not take eight seconds to compile. Uh, it, it was, you know, sitting in memory until a periodic sync came along and, and shoved it out. So what does that show, you know, creating a new file look like? We have to modify the black block bit map. We need a new block to write our data in. We need to write, modify the inode bitmap to uh, have a inode to point to that block and, um, we need to write to the root directory to actually put that file in the directory. So there's, there's the actual data 
there's all the metadata, there's the journaling containing the new version of the metadata, and by actually looking at this at the byte level, we can actually see the updated inode here appearing in the journal up here. So just, you know, the thing that at the user level we expect is sort of, okay, I'm doing one read, a file create, and a write, actually turns into this sort of blizzard of, of IO operations all over the disk, not, not really very sequential. Um, and I, th I think this is neat, is, is I, I was actually expecting it to be a little simpler than this, but the combination of journaling and writing out all the inodes and adding a new directory entry and all that really, really adds up. And when you're, when you're counting IOPS, every, every IOP counts. <laughs> uh, so there are a lot of other things you can do with the trace. Once you've got it, you can do working set analysis, you can uh, feed it back into a heat map and sort of compare, you know, is what happened, what regions of the disk are affected by what went on in the trace I captured. Uh, I can look at queue depth if you captured latency, how many concurrent IOs does my application send out? That's often a source of performance problems if the, uh, if the application just isn't capable of sending out enough IOs to keep the IO system busy. Um, so here's, here's a much bigger trace. This is actually compiling the Chintry file system. Uh, check, checking it out and doing make all. Uh, so, what, what what can we see here? Uh, we see source code getting written and then it gets read again throughout the build. That's not too surprising. Uh, even though the source code is small, uh, it tends to get paged out because object files are big, particularly when you're compiling C++. This solid green line is actually the file system journal. And then, my my guess, and I haven't fully verified, is this is sending out the libraries, and then we really turn on the file fire hose to compile the final executables and the unit tests. The unit tests are actually the bulk of the output of our build, as as hopefully you'd expect. So we can turn, uh, we can uh, zoom. In. How much time do I have left? When's, when's this session get over? All right, um, we can zoom in on the journal. You'll notice that even though the journal is a circular buffer, this build didn't actually create enough to cause it to wrap around. And you can get some idea of the amount of file creation by looking at the slope here. That early on when we're checking the files out, we're actually creating a lot of files, we're, we're changing a lot of metadata blocks, and then over the course of the build, that sort of smooths out. Um, the other thing I thought was cool to look at is how old is the data being read? So this is the time of read in that trace, and this is going back to the previous write. What was the time of that write? So, you know, this, this clear band here, you know, we expect to see that Linux does not immediately read back anything it has just written out that still resides in memory. We'd expect to see that. Here's our, here's our source code. Um, that is, is, you know, was written all in one chunk here and gets a lot of reads throughout the, the process. I was curious about this, this cluster up here. What's, what's the sort of this oldest data that is being read back? And it turns out, uh, you know, just spot checking those points, it's metadata. It's, it's the block bitmaps that they got written and then the allocator decided that was the bitmap, the section of bitmap it wanted to use again to allocate some more blocks. So, um, I thought this was cool. You guys don't look too bored. <laughs> um, so going, going, uh, so this, this is a neat experiment to run, is uh, you can actually do a parallel experiment um, for, a, for cache size. If you assume the cache it uses a least re recently used algorithm, it kicks out the oldest thing in the cache then you can uh, model that as a stack where every time you get a read or write, you take an object, the object from its stack, record the depth and move it to the top of the stack. And that, that record of depth tells you for every cache size whether it would be a hit or a miss. Okay, so applying that to that build trace, the interesting thing is we basically get n virtually no read hits unless we've got at least two gigabytes of cache. The virtual disk is, is 16 gigabytes in size. The build takes about 
10 gigabytes or something. Um, but this is, this is the Linux DRAM buffer cache in action. Anything that's frequently read or written is, is already being absorbed here in, in the read cache. Um, and it doesn't really get better until you, you have quite a lot of memory that uh, you need to get to about six gigabyte of cache just to get a 50% hit rate. So the, the moral of the story is LRU is actually not a very good caching algorithm to put on your storage device because the thing that it does best at is you know, getting recently read or written data, the operating system is already taken care of for you. I, I'd like to say, oh, the system has two gigabytes of cache. That doesn't seem to be true. It's an eight gigabyte virtual machine. It seemed to be using four gigabytes of, of uh, buffers and cache. Some of that is system disk for the compiler itself and stuff like that. But I, d I don't think the system was actually using two gigabytes. But this, this would be interesting to actually adjust the memory size and see, see how this changes. Okay, um, so I didn't have as much time. What was the number? Uh, uh, I was compiling the Tintree file system and all its unit tests. Um, so this is, this is, again, going back to a simple example, I don't have a complex example to go with this, of what does an SQL insert look like? Um, this was a little harder because uh, again, learning something, I, I switched to Postgres here. Postgres writes out this file like every 10 seconds. And so actually finding the stuff I had did done in the middle of the trace in comparison to all the other crap Postgres is just doing in the background was a little hard. But you know, here, here we go. We actually do two writes in quick succession to the transaction log. Then a little time, time later that is flushed to a database page and there are actually two separate files that get written. I believe this is an index, but I haven't, haven't looked at it yet. I'm writing to a table that's got just three rows, but it's got a, a primary key re restraint, which automatically creates an index. So, you know, again, we see a lot of metadata traffic to, to update the inodes, to journal the inodes before they're written. But this is basically, you know, more or less what would you expect. Write, write to the transaction sometime later, flush it out to the, the database, uh, the, the, the page file, I should say. So um, here's the data I wrote, hello world, and a, a date. Um, so we wrote four, kilo, four, whole full, four kilobytes, and this part looks like junk. And then that second log write, I don't understand what's going on here. We wrote an entire 4K of zeros. And, and I don't know if Postgres is just, if that's meaningful to Postgres or Postgres was just. <laughs> um, so again, you know, this, this is why I love it, that, that once you actually look at what's going on, there's all sorts of surprises of you know, why, why the heck is that happening? Um, and then, you know, here are the three writes to page file. I'm, I'm, my guess would be that this is some sort of allocation record because here's my hello world. And you'll notice it's actually at the very end of the block. So um, Postgres is, is filling in its data pages from the, from the bottom up, which is a pretty common strategy. Um, there may have been some zero pages when it was originally created, but, but no, all these were 4K writes. <laughs> I would have too, but I didn't find one. Okay, um, so I did want to give you a brief run through of some academic literature if you want to run off. That, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, this, this paper is the cutest, fast paper ever. I, I hope they don't mind me saying that on the internet. Um, it actually looks at sequences of NFS operations and deduces which operation you were running which program you were running. So they can say, oh, you did open access, read, 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 write, 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 you must have been doing CP. And they can do this for a non-trivial set. And, and I, I just think that's neat. I don't know what it's useful for, but it, it's neat. <laughs> um, 
th these two papers are sort of near and dear to my heart because I'm building second level caching systems underneath virtualized applications. And this paper says, if you run a tradi traditional file system on top of another traditional file system in a virtualized environment, they don't play well to together. Um, you know, they're both trying to optimize for situations which no longer exist in the virtualized environment. Um, this is an older paper uh, basically stating the, the result I, I hinted at is, you know, page replacement algorithms, LRU, do not work well as second level caches. You've already got an operating system doing all that work for you. Um, I think I saw somebody who had actually worked with the Arpachi Dussauds show, sign up for this session. But uh, I, love, I love this paper, a file is not a file. They actually looked at real application behavior uh, and took traces and saying, What's, what the heck's going on? You know, things that you would expect to be sequential I.O. of I'm just saving my file are not sequential, that you're popping all over. Even when you're streaming a video file, it will frequently refer back to some metadata embedded in it. So, you know, applications keep getting more complex. Storage doesn't actually become easier. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I should just stay here. Uh, anyway, th this, this is highly recommended, as are most of the stuff came out of the Arpachi Dussos. Um, this paper is something I wish I had more time to explore is actually predicting from the sequence of block accesses which one are is going to come next so that you can prefetch it, get it into memory so, so it has a low latency. They had some success. Uh, I'm not sure whether it really is a scalable solution, but, but it's, it's really, you know, in keeping with the other things I've been trying to do here is, is look at low level and predict what's gonna happen next. So I'd, I'd love to have had more time to look at other file systems Log structured file systems, as I mentioned a couple times, uh, look a lot different when you when you look at the traces and even when you look at the heat maps. You can you can just tell immediately that's a log structured file system. That that's a conventional file system. Um, I'd love to have done large scale database traces like I did with the the build. Uh, I I suspect we could distinguish indexed from non indexed queries just by looking at the yeah. pattern of reads, but I I, do, I don't know for sure. Uh, Better visualizations, I'm not a visualization expert. All the graphics here were done with GNU plot. <laughs> uh, if you have tools, I'd love to hear about them. I, I just coasted through my stats class in college. <laughs> so I, d I don't know too much about doing uh, good statistical tests like the, the cold metadata versus hot data. You know, is that statistically significant or just noise? I'd love to identify a test that would tell that. Like I said, block by block correlations, like the last paper I did. Um, if you think more in big data, a lot of things big data people love is clustering techniques. I think with the right inputs, you could you could actually do some interesting things here. But I don't know quite what those inputs would be. You know, bare traces aren't enough. Giving the whole file path seems like cheating. Is there some intermediate point that that's interesting? <laughs> All right, it's right there. Anyway, thanks for attending. Uh, feel free to email me, call, uh, uh, tweet, tweet me. Uh, <laughs> uh, any questions? Okay, thanks a lot.